12 verse, God's word translation, and the text says, when Jesus saw her, comma, he said, he called to her, yes, to come, and he said, comma, quotation woman, comma, you are free from your disability, period, exclamation. Yeah, let, let's look at that again. Uh, when Jesus saw her, he called to her and said, Woman, you are free from your disability. Do me a favor, you're standing. I don't know who you're standing next to. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't. But lean on just a little bit, just a little bit. Tell them this, tell them this. I was once bound, but Jesus set me free. Maybe they don't like the way they, you lean on them. Lean on somebody else. So I was once bound. But Jesus set me free. Jesus set me free. Woo! We're going to have a good time with Jesus on He set me free. Y'all can sit down if you're able to. He set me free. In the 1997 film, this, histor well, this historical drama entitled Amistad, uh, this movie directed by Steven Spielberg based on the true story and events that happened in 1839. It tells us that aboard a slave ship, the La Amistad, that, that the Mende tribesmen of, were abducted as slaves and taken from their home and, and they gained control of the ship from their captors somewhere around the coast of Cuba. And it ultimately ended in this international legal battle that followed their capture all the way uh, to the United States. Uh, and the case was ultimately decided in the U.S. Supreme Court in 1841. This is what I need you to see. Uh, whether you see the movie or not, here's something interesting in this. The leader of these African slaves, uh, Sidki, he was uh, in this battle and let them in their mutiny as it was, but in the courtroom scene, if you haven't seen the movie, check it out, something interesting happened as the battle was intensifying, the, the case was coming to its climactic point, something interesting happened, he looks around and he begins to say, give us free. Now this is interesting because he doesn't speak English, it's not his native language, he's only been here for a little while, but he's cognitively connected the fact that Freedom is something he deserves, and he screams out uh, in the courtroom, and he says, give us free, free, freedom, this power to determine action without restraint, freedom, this exemption from external control, freedom, freedom from interference and regulations, freedom on the cusp and precipice of July 4th, our national holiday of independence as a nation, as we celebrate and remember our independence. It was our freedom that we desired that helped to birth this great nation that we now call these United States of America. Today, in our text, we're going to find a woman that was in bondage as well. No, she didn't have chains and shackles hanging from her. It wasn't hanging from her extremities. However, she is in bondage, and there is a disabling spirit that has control over her. And she's been in this condition now nearly two decades. She can't stand up straight, family, and she can't even look up. And Likely, likely, in very severe pain, she is, in fact, in bondage. And as we'll discover today, a unique moment arises when she goes to the church one Sunday morning. She goes to the synagogue, and there is a collision that happens at the synagogue. The collision, as you'll see today, is her issues, their tradition, and the miracle-working Savior is all present at the same time. You know, some people see where you have landed today, they see where you are. 
And if not careful, some people might think that you've gotten to where you've gotten to overnight. What they don't realize is the struggle in your story, the survival in your story, the stick to itness of your story. And as you discover, like this woman, you might have been or might be, be found in some areas of your life even today. Maybe in your mind, maybe in your marriage, maybe your health, maybe or even in your finances. I'm excited because after today's message, I believe you're going to be in a position where you're extremely blessed because you're going to leave encouraged knowing that if God can set them free, sure, he can set me free too. Somebody give me a favor and shout freedom. Do it again, shout freedom, freedom. God bless you. Let's make it do what it do. Luke the 13th chapter. Luke the 13th chapter. Yeah, Luke the 13th chapter. We started there this morning. We started right at verse 12, but I want to back that thing up, if you would, to verse 10. The text says something really interesting. It begins with three crucial and critical words. The text says, one Sabbath day. And again, the God's Word translation of the text begins with what it says, one Sabbath day. Now this detail, as I begin to unpack and unravel this text this morning, is re really important to our story today because it's so important that this vital information, how this text begins, one Sabbath day, you must understand what this really means in order to appreciate and understand the purpose and power of Jesus' miracle. So let's deal with this one Sabbath day, one Sabbath day, one Sabbath day. We find Jesus teaching in the synagogue as was his custom, and he's teaching on the Sabbath. It seems like everything is going well until something happens. While Jesus is teaching, he notices something. Luke 13, chapter 11, verse, look at this one. In Luke 13, 11, the NLT says it like this. It says, he saw who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. I told you already, it's the Sabbath day. Something happens. Jesus is teaching, minding his business, doing what he does. And the text says, he saw a woman. And this woman apparently has some physical deformities that is clearly visible to someone that isn't feeling her pain nor is in her body. You can see her issue. Now, when Jesus sees this woman, you must understand, as we understand these three, these three crucial and critical words, one Sabbath day, this presents what we might describe a conundrum, a predicament, a dilemma, a dispute, an issue, a problem, and possibly even a complication. Why, you might be asking, Pastor, because this woman, as you will see, is clearly in need of freedom. She has arrived at the place that should be be where she is set free, but the problem is she's arrived at the synagogue on the Sabbath. Mm. Wait a minute now. I don't want you to anachronistically look at this text from your 21st century mindset and impose because there is, in fact, a problem. Houston, we have a problem. This woman has the audacity to show up at the church on the Sabbath day with issues. I can hear somebody saying, well, pastor, you're going to have to help me because I don't really see the problem with her coming to the church on the Sabbath with issues. Well, I'm glad you asked, so let me help you. What do you do when 
you have something great to give. But your context and your tradition wants to hold you back. Say it again, Pastor. What, what do you do when you have something great to give? But the context that you're in and the tradition that you're in wants to hold you back. Okay, well, let me unpack this problem a little further. We have a woman with an issue. She's at the church on the Sabbath before a Savior with the power to set her free. Oh, wait, did I forget to mention that this situation that I just described to you is like a pig in a blanket. It's wrapped up with rules and regulation and rabbinic traditions that want to restrict her reconciliation, her rejuvenation, and her restoration, might I add her resuscitation, to all the problems that this woman had. Okay, all I'm really trying to say, a couple two dollar words, it says that Jesus had the power to heal this woman on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, but the context, culture, and tradition said, you can't do it. Ah, uh, we got a problem. This woman needs deliverance and healing. She showed up at the right place and should be at the right time. But the context, culture, tradition, rabbinic tradition, and rules regulation says you can't do this on the Sabbath. Okay. So, if before I can help you understand this woman's breakthrough, so that by the end of the service you can get your breakthrough, I need to help you understand what Jesus had to break through during this moment. John 5 and 16. I'm coming back to Luke. John 5 and 16. John 5 and 16. The text says something interesting. It says, and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Read it again, Pastor. John, the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter, 16th verse. Hold this spot in Luke, I'm coming back. The text says, and this is why, this why was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Throughout Jesus' ministry here on earth, he had been accused to be a Sabbath breaker. This is good because I told you our text in Luke begins with through three crucial and critical words, one Sabbath day. And before I can unpack this woman's issue, you've got to understand what's going on and, the, and some historicity behind the Sabbath day. Jesus had been described and labeled as a Sabbath breaker, one that doesn't keep the tradition of honoring the Lord, resting and abstaining from work on the Sabbath day. The truth is, as you look closer at Jesus' life, his stories, his miracles, is that Jesus clearly did perform miracle on the Sabbath. Yeah, you don't got to go far. You can peruse through the Gospels, and you can see that, okay, let me just give you a few examples. Over in Matthew 12 chapter, we saw a man that had a withered hand, and Jesus told him to stretch out his hand, and Jesus healed him. Did I tell you it was the Sabbath day? On the Sabbath day, Jesus rebuked the man that had an unclean spirit, and he was in the synagogue. It was on the Sabbath day. Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Did I tell you this was on the Sabbath day? And in Capernaum, one, sa one Sabbath day evening, they brought all the Jesus that were oppressed with demons and sick with various diseases, and Jesus cast out demons, that, and he wouldn't allow them to speak. Did I tell you this all happened on the Sabbath day. Let me go a little bit further. There was a man by the pool at Bethesda waiting for the waters to be stirred, and he had an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus healed him, told him to pick up his bed and walk. Might I mention to you, family, it was on the Sabbath day. I should go further. There was a blind man. He was born blind, and Jesus spit on the ground, making mud with his saliva. He anointed the man's eyes and told the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. It was on the Sabbath day, and today we find Jesus with a woman with a disabling spirit. Did I already tell you it is the Sabbath day? Somebody said, we got a problem. 
Jesus and the Sabbath day, he was not foreign to doing miracles on the Sabbath day. Although many people were healed and set free on the Sabbath, you gotta understand that this was, in fact, a problem. See, with all these miracles that were being performed and everything that was happening on the Sabbath, Jesus was breaking the long-held rabbinic traditions. Yeah, you know, you got the laws and you got the laws that people add to it, making it hard to follow. Y'all know how people are. Jesus, family, was moving countercultural and not following the ways of these religious folks. And this was happening frequently enough that as Luke describes over in the sixth chapter and the seventh verse, he says, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, this is good, to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. Read it again, Pastor, because they need to understand these three crucial and critical words, one Sabbath day. Luke 6, 7 again says, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, they watched Jesus, to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. These, the religious folk, started waiting for Jesus to heal and do miracles on the Sabbath day because why? They were trying to find a reason that they could accuse him. Accuse him of what? Of being a Sabbath breaker. And they in fact did accuse him. The culture, rules, tradition, the religious people have made regarding the Sabbath family had become an end within itself and they had missed the true meaning and the purpose of the Sabbath. Now, although they saw Jesus as a Sabbath breaker, you should know that Jesus did not see himself as a Sabbath breaker. I wish I had more time. Because, you know, people see you one way, but that might not be the way you see yourself. People label you. You know what? People talk about what they don't understand. Okay, let me go further because I got somewhere to go. The text says, then the text helps us understand that they saw Jesus as a Sabbath breaker, but Jesus didn't see himself that way. He went to the synagogue regularly on the Sabbath day. That's what the text tells us in Luke, the fourth chapter. The text tells us that Jesus read the lessons. He preached and he taught on the Sabbath day. That's what the text over in Mark, first chapter, Luke, 13th chapter tells us. Jesus clearly accepted the principle that the Sabbath was an appropriate day for worship. The point of collision, though, because I said we got a problem, the point of collision with the Pharisees was at the point when their, when their tradition began to conflict and collide with what Jesus was doing. You know, on one Sabbath day, Jesus was walking through a grain field, and as he was walking through the field, he began to pick off some of the some of the wheat, the heads of wheat in the grain field, and they accused him of breaking the Sabbath because they said this qualified as harvesting. They saw him as a Sabbath breaker. But Jesus makes a statement over in Mark, the second chapter, the 27th verse. He says something important. He says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. I'm almost there. The rabbinic tradition had exalted the institution of the Sabbath above the people it was meant to serve. By making the Sabbath an end in itself, the Pharisees had effectively, family, robbed the Sabbath of its main purpose. Jesus, his healing on the Sabbath, put him on a collision course with all these rabbinic traditions. 
the Old Testament family, if we're going to unpack this, three crucial and critical words, one Sabbath day, the Old Testament does not forbid cures on the Sabbath day. Watch this. But the rabbis, yeah, the leaders of the time, labeled all healing as work which must be avoided on the Sabbath unless someone's life was at risk. But Jesus, he worked fearlessly and exposed the callousness and absurdity of their inconsistency, which led to such an attitude. Jesus was showing them, how can you circumcise a baby or lead an animal to water on the Sabbath day? And as we'll find and we're unpacking this morning, there is a woman that is chronically ill and has a chronic back issue, and how come this woman can't get healed? Jesus was working to teach the people that the Sabbath was particularly an appropriate day for acts of mercy. Jesus was reminding his disciples and opponents that the Sabbath is a sign of redemption. The same God that had broken the enemy's power in Egypt that commanded his people to remember the great act of mercy by observing the Sabbath. It is the miracles that Jesus performed that he was now breaking Satan's grip on the lives of people that were in bondage. Jesus, in fact, calls himself he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is what the Old Testament prophesied about in Isaiah. And here we find Jesus on the Sabbath day. And he sees the woman. Now that you better understand these three crucial, critical, and vital words, one Sabbath day, we can begin to deal with this woman's issues, her breakthrough, so that you can get your breakthrough. But now that you understand the background behind this one Sabbath day and why the text begins with this critical, important detail, one Sabbath day, let's look at this woman's issues. The text says, there was a woman and she was apparently bent over so badly that she was unable to look up. What do we know about this woman? We know that she was present in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. What do we know about her? We know that she has a severe case of what we might describe and diagnose today as chronic arthritis. We know that she has a severe curvature in her spine. We know that it was so severe, family, that she couldn't even look up. The Greek word has a sense meaning here that she was doubled over. She was curled up, as it were, in pain. The text says she had been afflicted and stared by the devil with this condition, which the text describes as a disabling spirit, how long has she been here? Nearly two decades. 18 years. This woman with a chronic curvature of spine, so bad that she couldn't even look up. Imagine every day of your life, you walk around looking down and only seeing everybody's feet. Imagine every day of your life, as you walk from to and fro, you don't know if you're about to bump into something or not. You're looking down. You don't know what's happening. It's hard to determine if the sun is shining, what's happening around you, if people are smiling, if they're mad, happy, or glad, because your curvature of spine is so bad that all that you can do is look down. I wish I could tell you this was only for 18 hours or, or even 18 days, 
Hey, I wish I could tell you it was only for 18 months, but unfortunately, her condition was here for 18 years. And no matter how much she wanted to stand up, she couldn't do it. This woman had a disabling spirit, a, a spirit of sickness and weakness. She, she came to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Did I only tell her she got issues? Now what's interesting as we look at this, this woman came to the synagogue on the Sabbath with issues and a sickness, and what's interesting is she did not seek out Jesus for a miracle. Oh, this is good because she's in the place where miracles in our context, let's say, should be performed. But if you look at this woman, she didn't go seeking Jesus for a miracle. The text says, and I started with this, when Jesus saw her, okay, we come to this side. When Jesus saw her, let me come to the old listen online. When Jesus saw her, I noticed it didn't say when she saw Jesus. It said when Jesus saw her. I noticed it did not say when she ran to Jesus. It said when Jesus saw her. I noticed it did not say when she cried to Jesus. It says when Jesus saw her. We don't know much about this woman's background. We don't know if she's married, single. We don't know if she has children. Uh, but we do know that she has a sickness. <laughs> and she's in the synagogue on the Sabbath in front of the Savior. This woman seems to come for no other reason but to hear Jesus' teaching. And it appears, family, that she didn't come to the synagogue on this particular day, according to the gospel, seeking a miracle. Might I say that oftentimes when people came to Jesus, here it comes, they wanted something from Jesus. Y'all know anybody like that? That only come to Jesus when they want something from Jesus. That only pray when they want something from Jesus. That only worship when they want something from Jesus. That only come to church only because something is going bad in their life. I don't know, this woman appears to be at the synagogue not so much because of her need, but because she wanted to hear a word. Might I add that typically, often, when people came to Jesus, this is what happened. When Jesus would walk through a city or go in a place, they called out to him. They yelled out to him. They went as far as we find a woman with an issue of blood, the text says, and she pressed her way through the crowd and she touched the hem of his garment. You know, when people wanted Jesus bad enough, the Bible says there was a brother that was a paralytic and he had some friends and they couldn't get to the place where Jesus was teaching because it was so crowded. So they said, what's the next place we can go? And they looked up and they said, let's tear the roof off. Because they had to get to Jesus. The text says when Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus because he was short in stature, he did what he had to do. He said, let me climb up so I could see Jesus. We're living a life.